Hi, Lorelai. This extra, uh, this video is for uh, your a dozen a day group five exercises, the last five of your book, and um, I think I will. I, I explained pretty well. I think on the um, on the printout that I, I think you got. Um, <clears throat> I'll just demonstrate some of the ways to practice, uh, especially this, um, um, you know, the triplets. So you can practice uh, these, which are not exactly what is written on the music. So, for instance, um, spinning a big top, number eight. Um, these are triplets, and I know that you'll be playing with a metronome. But the idea is to keep the wrist flexible and you kind of want to rotate it a little and to um, loosen up the wrist as you go. Because when you just play with your finger with a really still hand, it could tighten up. Any repetitive mo movements are really hard to, um, you know, keep, uh, play with a relaxed wrist unless you get some movement in there. So, um, the right hand alone, it, you basically play one measure, you have a one measure rest and you have a min, one measure again. You could just play, you know, over and over again for like several measures long and see if you can get the wrist turn going. And <clears throat> while you do that, you want to make sure that your, um, your fingers are not tight and your wrist is not tight and nothing is tight. You just, you know, lightly, I wouldn't say bounce your wrist because that will force the thumb to have an accent or, or the pinky or something. So you want to keep your, you know, finger wrist. So that's why, you know, having the good bent finger is important to give you the a little extra give so that you're not, um, you know, hitting the key like you're hitting with a stick. So, like that. And try to keep it soft. <clears throat> that will be an indication that you're, you know, able to play, you know, without tensing up. Because when you have really hard, strong hands, you will wind up, you know, hitting down on the keys rather hard. So you want to keep it very soft. Same thing with the left hand, you know, do you turn it similarly? So, you, you know, each person probably has a different way that you use the wrist when you're doing this because it all boils down to like the relationship of the length of the finger, like, you know, like the middle finger is the long finger and then the pinky and the thumb are the short ones and you want to just you, use some sort of a wrist motion so that you don't tense up at all. You will, you can try a number of times and you don't, for that you don't have to use a metronome, just sort of, you know, figure out what works for you. Um, really, um, piano playing is, uh, you basically try to play the same music, but you already have different hands, different arms, and, you know, just different, um, you know, five motor skills to begin with, and you try to achieve a similar result using what you've got. And, um, being a, you know, being a, you know, being a female pianist, I often, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I like to, you know, read discussions or talk with friends about, how hard it is for us to be playing piano with these smaller hands as opposed to, you know, those very tall Russian men who are very successful pianists who have enormous hands. I think I might have talked to um, um, your brother about it. Um, you know how I could reach from C to E, you know, which is a good size hand and I have, I have very flexible fingers too, so I could reach C to E. But Rachmaninoff and Franz Liszt, they used to spread their fingers as wide as they could. They could reach up to the A. That's how big and how long their fingers were. So if they place a hand on the keyboard, it was like, you know, the hand already appeared bigger than the, the you know, this length of the depth of the keyboard itself. So, you know, how those people use their hands are, is going to be so completely different from us. And even different for, you know, kids who have even smaller hands. Of course, you will eventually grow into an adult and your hands will, your fingers will get longer, your hands will get bigger. But, um, you know, you will just figure out how it works for you. Now, um, similarly, uh, going on to number nine, 
<clears throat> this is, um, you know, it, it goes up and down, right? So I think this involves a little bit more of the elbow motion. For this, you would definitely want to use like the whole entire arm without, use, without moving it too much, but you want to loosen your whole arm. So go out and back. And then I'm definitely using uh, my upper arm for it to get the motion going. <clears throat> And it's actually a great um, analogy. The earlier number eight exercise was a spinning a big top. So it's a top that you, you know, that you rotate, you twist, right? I mean, even a big top, I don't know how big is it? Like maybe this big. This one is rolling a hoop, which is significantly bigger than a, um, than a top. So you could already imagine that the motion that they're trying to um, convey to you will be a bigger one. So earlier it was just a wrist turning. This time is more the whole arm um, turning, if you can. Um, so you know, have have your arms, you know, loosen it up, and you know, move your shoulder a little bit, and you don't have to sit like super stiff at your piano. Try to, um, you know, have your arms ready to move, and then turn the arm as you go. Okay, and those are the two, um, you know, triplet exercises that involve some motion, you know, along with it. Um, now, um, I, I wrote on the notes, um, your instruction sheet, about the how to make uh, about number ten. How to make the legato when you're playing thirds, and like from there to the next one, you want to make a legato, or at least make a sound like a legato. And as you can see, um, between the E G, you have a three five finger. Next one is C E. You're repeating the E, right? You you have to play E both times. So as you know, when you play the piano, you have to to play the E the second time. You have to lift it once and then press it down. So that, in a way, you can never make a legato of two same keys. But the G and the C you can. G to the C. So you basically compromise um, the legato by detaching the E but keeping the G when you go to the next. So I'm going to exaggerate this time. And then pinky stays down, E goes up, and then play C E together. So, ultra, uh, um, so E G. E goes up, G stays down, and play C E. And same thing with the left hand. E goes up, and then all of the second line is that same sequence. E up, E up. And um. I'm, I'm actually quite impressed that you had no problem doing the 1-3 followed by the 2-4. That requires strength and um, for somebody, you know, not, not so, you know, not so old or not so big, you have good strong hands and you must have something to do with the fact that you actually do play always on, on playing on a real piano which has some weight to it. Um, it's, it's not easy to, you know, develop a good strong um, strength on your fingers if you were playing on like, say, keyboards, for instance. And I've even heard that, you know, in the old days, there used to be some pianos, they were not regulated properly at times. So, you know, some pianos will have a heavier key and others will have lighter. Um, Yamahas, I've always thought that they have slightly lighter keys and kawaii pianos, I thought had heavier keys. I, and um, Steinways were always very comfortable. But I have played on a really old antique piano that was called a, um, um, upright grand piano. It was a very large, large um, upright piano that my piano teacher had that was, I think, made in Italy or somewhere. Um, at that time, it was easily 100 years old. And she used to tell me how the keys were deeper than the regular pianos at the time. So this is like during the 80s. Um, so I recall feeling like, you know, when you actually do press down on the 
keys, it was a little bit more effort. So, you know, when in that case, it's really hard to play fast and strong. Um, and, you know, it's hard to maintain the endurance for those um, heavy key pianos. But nonetheless, you have good fingers. You have good, strong fingers. So, you know, this number 10 sounds great already. Next is to just learn the legato from. And E goes up first. Okay, now um, let's go to number 11. 11, I think, um, just remember that you want to play a legato between the two hands. Here you're listening to that C major triad. You know, this is very unstable sounding. And then you get a relief. Or. And you get to listen to that nice harmony at the end. Okay, so that's easy enough. Just maintain a good legato. And number 12. Um, well, the, I think the right hand the rhythm might be a, um, a little bit tricky, so I'll play it once, once just so that you have something to, you know, listen to when you get confused. The very last measure it's three beats because the fourth beat belongs to the very beginning of the song there's an upbeat um, I actually just remembered as I was playing that um, here is another um, thing that you might want to think about which is that um, from the upbeat to this there's a G see uh, the beat four of most of the measures I think you know that that's a beat four that's a G beat four is a G beat three and four G and then well that does it's D C but there's a G again G C and then G C G D and um, slurring the right hand or legato keeping the right hand legato while the left hand um, uh, block chords uh, are playing as accompaniment is going to be a bit of a challenge so you what you want to think is um Right hand stays down, left hand went up, and then you play together. Left hand goes up first and together. Up. And simula similarly, left hand goes up, right, right hand stays down. So that was exaggerated. So that's the approach you want to take. If, if it helps, you can put like a quarter rest at the, um, you know, after all of these uh, block chords. Imagine that you were playing that as a dotted half note and you have a quarter rest there. That will give you kind of a, um, an idea that, oh yes, the left hand is going to be not, not playing anything uh, and right hand is going to play that note and then you play together at beat one. That might help you to maintain the right hand um, legato because I'm pretty sure that most kids will wind up doing this. So that actually, you know, right hand is now you're breaking up into measure by measure blocks, but the the overall phrase, as you can, you know, see from the lyric, a dozen a day before I play keeps the kinks away. So it's like one long line. And here you can actually raise both hands and start over again. Um, there are two large phrases in this um, number 12 exercise. So, you know, if you, if you um, let, I, I would, you know, 
encourage you to uh, practice that. Lift the left hand while right hand keeps on playing the melody. The right hand will have zero rest. Left hand can have a few rests, uh, a little bit of a you know rest between the chords. You just can't do a legato on those you know long notes with the left hand. So, yeah. Okay. I will. I think I don't. I have a feeling you don't probably don't need any help for um, um, the piano adventures. So I'll leave it at this. Okay. Bye.